Okay, so let's start off by talking about your work. Do you work or do you study? Well, I'm currently working. I finished my studies two years ago, so I'm currently working as a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. And where do you currently work? I currently work in Dublin. I came in Dublin um, a few months ago. I worked previously in Romania from where I am. Mm -hmm. And why did you choose that career? Well, I think my mother has some influences on me. So she's, a, uh, she's an assistant and she always uh, thought that pharmacy will suit me and it's an easy job and a respected job. So she kind of pushed me to do pharmacy. So I chose pharmacy in the end. Mm -hmm. And do you enjoy your job? Um, I do now. Like when I was in Romania, I didn't like it that much, but now in Ireland the system is different and I feel more appreciated for my work so uh, it starts to grow on me. Mm -hmm. Good. So now let's talk about your hometown. Okay. okay. So where are you from? Uh, I am from a small town in Romania. So I grew up in a really small town and then I moved uh, to a larger city near to my town. And, and it's called Negresht. <laughs> So it's difficult for foreigners to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And do you like your hometown? Um, I didn't like it when I was a child. I like it now because uh, it's a small town, a small community where you can raise your children with no problems, with no bad influences. So it's a good place where you can grow up uh, and be a decent person. Mm -hmm. good. And how often do you visit your hometown? Uh, now that I'm living in Ireland, probably I will visit it. Well, I will visit once or twice a year. But when I lived in the other city in Yash, uh, I went to Negresh to th maybe twice a month. Mm -hmm. And how do you think your hometown could be improved? Well, because it's a small community, maybe just improve. Uh, the job offers try to raise the local economy. Most of the people that are living there are farmers or they are working in construction. So maybe just improve that part uh, and they can live better. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about your childhood. Did you have a nice childhood? <laughs> yes, I did. Like I said, um, it was a small community, so my parents knew every neighbors that we had. Uh, they weren't afraid to, uh, to leave me with kids on the street just to play or let me out in the night to going with my friends uh, to have some fun. So it, it was nice. Mm -hmm. um, what is your first memory? Mm, my first memory is a funny one. Uh, I was two years and a half and I ran from my grandparents' house to go to Kittengard where my uh, aunt was going. So I missed her so much that I ran out of the house and come back with her uh, a few hours later. And uh, when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I always loved medicine, pharmacy, science in general. So I knew I would be a biology teacher, a doctor, a pharmacist, something that related with the science part. Mm -hmm. And what hobbies did you have as when a you child? Were a child? <laughs> well, I tried a lot of hobbies. I tried singing, I tried sports, I did. Uh, actually karate, I did a lot of them, but I never found one that it suits me 100%. So I don't think I have a, a hobby. Okay, good. All right, that's the end of part one. We're gonna move on to part two now. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a cue card with a topic on it. You should read that cue card and you will have one minute to prepare an answer. After that one minute, I'll let you know when the one minute is up and you should speak about the topic on the cue card for up to two minutes. Okay. Is that okay? All right, there's the cue card. I'll start the stopwatch. <laughs> Okay, 
we speak for up to two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to talk about my first computer that I got uh, when I was like eight or ten years old. Uh, back then, uh, we didn't have an internet connection, so it was pretty easy to use it, especially for a kid that did some computer science in school. So basically, I used it only for basic games that I already had pre-installed on uh, my system, I listened to music, uh, movies that I borrowed from my friends. Uh, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't hard to, for me to learn uh, computer science on that one because uh, with the develop of the technology, we got also a computer uh, uh, internet connection in our house. So practically, I started to grow up at uh, the same time with the technology. So now uh, the main benefits that I'm getting from that w uh, are uh, me knowing to use uh, and discover more utilities of the computer, uh, new programs. Uh, I can manage to solve my own problems with the computer, uh, hardware or software. Um, I also don't have any difficulties when it comes uh, to work, to solve a problem with my system at work. Uh, also, I think because we as a generation grew up with a computer in our houses, we got a lot of advantages of this because nowadays everyone is depending on a smart device or a computer, so that helped a lot. And I even start, okay. <laughs> so that's, that's the end of, uh, of, the, of part two. Okay. And we're gonna move on to part three now. All right. So. We've been talking about technology, and we're going to continue to talk about technology for a little bit. And we're going to talk about technology as it relates to education. So the first question is, do you think someone can learn a language using an online course? Yeah, I just did that. It's not like I've learned a language, a new language, but an online course can help as much as um, face-to-face -face teacher can help you if it's a good course and it has enough explanation on it uh, they can help you a lot to um, to get the information that you're missing so for example if we are speaking about a vocabulary course for a, a beginner uh, a, a good course will provide the learner uh, the basic words the basic grammar and everything that they have to, to know in the beginning of learning that language. Mm -hmm. And should schools use more technology in the classroom? Well, I think so because children nowadays use their smart, mo their smart mobiles and smart devices uh, all the time. So they are very familiar with uh, technology and schools uh, should really improve their classrooms. I don't know about Ireland in general, but in Romania we didn't have computers in our classrooms. We had only one, uh, one, one room with computers and uh, the rest were all old books. So every uh, new information that we got, uh, it, it came from books and not an actual technology piece or, I don't know, let's say we are studying biology, it's easier to study something that you can see 3D, like with holograms, than seeing in a book. And do you think one day AI, artificial intelligence, will replace teachers in the classroom? Mm, no, I don't think that because a teacher can come with some experience in the back, can come with more than an artificial intelligence can bring. Like it's a personal experience that a student can uh, cor correlate with the lesson and uh, remember that particular story from the teacher's experience and uh, correlate it with what he learned. So I don't think a computer could do that. Even though it's programmed to be like an intel artificial intelligence, I don't think it will accomplish that. Now let's talk uh, about technology and society. So has 
technology improved how we communicate with each other? It has. If we are speaking about smartphones, for example, uh, now we can not only can call each other, we can text in a few seconds, we can video call, we can use the internet connection to see each other uh, from big distances, like I am with my family. The smart device that I'm using is helping me a lot to uh, keeping in touch with them. And why are some people now reducing the amount of time they spend on electronic devices? Mm, I think uh, at some point we got um, overwhelmed by the technology around us and now people are trying to realize that the social connection that uh, are between people are starting to fade so they are, tr they are trying to uh, restart a real connection between people and uh, give up a little bit of social internet uh, and actually doing some sociali socialization. <laughs> okay, good. Well done. That's it over. You can breathe now. You can relax. <laughs> and you ended up with socialization at the end. So <laughs> Very good. So now I'm going to give you some advice. Um, and I'm basing this advice on the fact that you've done the test three times now. You got a band six the first time then in speaking, seven. then you got seven, and then, and then you got eight yeah. in speaking yeah. before. OK, so you're continually improving. And what we want to do with you is to make sure that next time you do the test, that you absolutely 100% are going to get at least the score that you need because as a pharmacist you need a band seven yeah. what you're struggling a little bit with writing at the minute but sometimes students will focus so much on writing and let's say they're at a band seven mm -hmm. for speaking and they'll focus so much on on, on writing that they forget, or they yeah. forget or or they, they they just are a little bit complacent when it comes to to speaking so what we're going to the advice i'm going to give you now is to make sure that you would never fall below a, a, a seven mm -hmm. and, and to make sure that, that you get there okay so first of all i'm going to go through each part and then i'm going to go through the four marking criteria yep. so um you did something in part one, which is very, very common, where, uh, um, where you were a little bit nervous at, in the beginning. Yeah. So when we're talking about work, you were a little bit more hesitant, shorter answers, and that is totally normal. And the exam most examiners will, will, will expect that. Um, because part one is, is, is important, but it is designed to let you ease into the test and to let you warm up. So that's why they ask you questions about work, about your hometown, about your home, which you know are, are quite yeah. easy questions to try and get you warmed up. And as you went through, when you were talking about your hometown and more when you were talking about your childhood, you were talking far more fluently, you were developing your yes. answers. It was, yeah, more relaxed. So the, uh, when you're talking about work, it was like, not robotic, but, when you're talking about hometown and childhood, it's like talking to a friend about, so if, uh, if you and I were in a coffee shop and I was saying, you know, what, what, did you have a nice childhood? You're like, yeah, I did, and just talking naturally, and, and, and that was great to see. So part one was, was really good. The, the examiners would never listen to your first few answers that were a little bit, let's say they were a little bit short, fluency a little bit hesitant. They would never base their score on those first few answers so some people watching now would be like oh she gave one short answer she gets a band six like that's not how the examiners think or how the marking criteria thinks the examiner will base their score on the totality the, the, your total performance not on one short answer or one answer where you hesitated for example so um for for part one and um, the the length was good You're, you really eased into it your fluency was excellent. Some nice vocabulary in there. Some grammatical errors, but we'll talk about that when we talk about the four um, marking criteria. Part two, I think part two was the, was the area that um, you, you struggled with a little bit um, compared to the other parts, because there was a lot of pausing, a lot of hesitation. Um, so your fluency wasn't as good in part two as it was in part one and, and part three. Um, I'll tell you why I th think, but it's always good to hear from the student. Why did you 
think that you were struggling or did you you di didn't do a bad job by the way it was just in comparison to the other parts you were there was more audible pauses and like uh, uh, uh. yeah i've noticed that myself um maybe because i tried to i forgot about some ideas that i had in my head and i tried to see if i got all those uh, dots on the um, on the card i know i don't have to speak about all of them they are just guidelines but uh I don't know, I didn't, I like, at some point I felt stuck mm -hmm. and didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's why with the long pauses. So the, the, the audible pauses um, are normally caused by one of two things. One is um, linguistic or related to grammar, related okay. to vocabulary. So you're trying to think of the correct word, for, for example. Um, the other one is related to ideas, people trying to think of content, basically, things to say. Was it linguistic? Were you trying to think of the correct vocabulary and grammar? No. Or was it well, just ideas? Ideas. Ideas, yeah. So the, the examiner will, will also notice that uh, because if you are constantly stopping because you're trying to think of the correct verb tense or trying to think of the correct vocabulary, that's a signal to the examiner that uh, you have a problem with the English language. If you're just pausing because you're just trying to think of the next thing to say, that's not really a problem with the English language. It's more of a problem with the, the subject. The, the, yeah. the subject and, uh, and so. so the examiner should take that into account. But one of the things that I noticed that you did, which normally causes uh, a drop in fluency related to content, is you listed a lot of things. So you're, you're like, um, so for example, um, it could be, I went to the shop and I got bananas and apple and cheese yeah. and cereal and, the, uh, and, 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 and they're trying to think of the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It's much easier just to pick one of those things. So you're talking about software versus hardware and go a little bit deeper into that and tell like, a story related to that or example yeah. related to that. Because I think a lot of people go through part two and they're just like, okay, I need to talk about this. Let's list a lot of things about that. Then this, list a lot of things, this. Th and then you run out of time or run out of things to say. So I think in the, when you're doing the real test, um, don't be afraid to go very deep into one thing and, and especially pick one thing that you're comfortable talking about. Like, uh, for example, I got, uh, when I was a little girl, I got Windows 2000 or something yeah. like that. And, and how the changes that it made were blah, 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 blah. And I really learned a lot about programming through that. And so that's much better than we had Windows and we had Adobe and we had this and we had this and we had this. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. That, yeah. That, that just makes it easier for you to be more fluent. Mm. And I, um, so I think that's the only, in terms of fluency and coherence, that's the only area of concern that I would have. You weren't, like, you, your fluency wasn't terrible, um, but we're just making sure that you would never go below a seven. Yeah. And, and if you, that topic is, sounds like something you know a lot about, but if you got another topic, yeah, that right. you don't like, uh, um, that could that could turn into a, a problem for you, um, and, and it's part two is such a big part of the of the test that if you get a, a topic you aren't comfortable with, plus you're trying to think of content that can really drag down your fluency scores. So um, that that would be my main bit, bit of advice to go deep uh, on a few things you 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 feel comfortable talking about, mm -hmm. rather than trying to list everything. Oh, okay. And um, examples and stories are, are um, great. Like the story you told about when you were a little girl running after your auntie, you were very, very, very fluent because you're just talking naturally. Yeah. Um, it's much easier to talk about something you know about than to try and think of something completely abstract and to, to list lots of things. But overall, I, th I thought it was good because you, you got to the two minutes that most people don't get to the two minutes and speaking in a foreign language for two minutes is not not easy um for part three i think you did really really well for part three you had no problems with any of the questions and a lot of the questions like for example will ai replace teachers why are some people reducing their time on, on their electronic those are difficult questions and the examiners will if they think that you are 
you know, a seven or a band eight or a band nine, they'll ask you more and more difficult questions to see if they can stretch you and, and, and really <laughs> test you. So if you get difficult questions, that's a good thing, be happy. If they ask you really simple questions, like, you know, um, then <laughs> you might have a problem, but you, uh, you, you coped very, very well with those questions. I like the way that you answered the questions, gave an explanation, gave an example to help you fully answer, fully develop the, the question. So part three, you finished very, very strongly. And in the test, don't be afraid to keep going in part three, or you should keep going in part three, because people often feel tired and they just want it to be over. So they give very short answers for part three. Um, often people do that subconsciously as well. They're just like, oh, I, I'm sick of this. But you did a, you did a really good job on, on, on development. Development is the most important thing, I think, apart from the four marking criteria. Um, development in part three is the most important thing and you, you did a good job with that so um well done let's talk about four marking criteria your strongest area is pronunciation like many romanian students your you, the clarity of what you're saying is very very good i can understand a hundred percent of what you're saying any ielts examiner would be able to understand a hundred percent of what you're saying so that means that you would be getting at least a band seven for pronunciation plus you have very good use of intonation sentence stress word stress connected speech all these higher level pronunciation features you have a very good command of those um, which means you you would get more than a seven for pronunciation so when you combine the examiner can understand everything, plus you're using those higher level pronunciation features. So that's probably why you got a band eight the last time, because you can't get a band eight without using the higher level pronunciation features. Um, for fluency and coherence, your coherence is very good because you answered every question properly. You, you uh, stuck to the answering the question rather than going off topic and you fully developed your question. So for part one, you don't need to give very, very long answers. You gave a few answers that were quite short at the beginning, but the rest were fine. Uh, part two, you talked for two minutes, so that was fine. And part three, you fully developed your answers by answering the question, explaining, giving examples. So that was good to see. Fluency um, was very good in part one, quite good in part three, dropped a little bit in part two, um, but we've already talked about that, that uh, how, how to get around that. And I would encourage you to um, don't be complacent about speaking and maybe practice part two, because yeah. part two seems to be the area that you need to, that the only area that you really need to worry on about. The yeah. It depends on yeah. the subject, so maybe I should do more subjects with various teams yeah. and have an answer about yeah. and some ideas. It's, you know, a, a pint of sweat is better than a drop of tears. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, don't, you, wanna, you wanna do your, the hard work um, in, in, during your preparation, make it as difficult as possible. So the test day is a breeze and it's, it's no big deal um, for you. Um, so that though that would be my only concern with fluent your fluency is very good um it's it's at, at least a a band seven level but um you know as i said before if you got a, a a topic that you know nothing about and they're going to ask you about the same topic in general in part three so it's like you know you said before you got uh, they're asking about history and you don't know anything about it or you don't know very little about history so that could cause fluency problems because you don't have a problem with the language, but you might have a problem with the content. So you're trying to think of, the, of those things. But in general, it's very, it's rare. I don't think you would ever get a, uh, a topic that you know nothing about. Like history is something that you know a little bit about. Yeah. You know the, what the First World War was and, or the Second World War. And you know, so you can, you, they're not testing your um, knowledge of the Second World War or the First World War. They're talking about whether you can talk about a range of, of topics. Um, your vocabulary uh, is quite good. You have a really nice range of vocabulary. I asked you about many different topics. You have no problem talking about all of those topics. So that, because I was asking about a range of topics and you have topic-specific vocabulary related to all of those, 
you have n um, that would indicate that you have a very wide ranging vocabulary because if you ask someone about five or six different topics and they have topic specific vocabulary about all of those that means that you could talk about pretty much any t general topic so that was very very good collocations are something that I would that I would work on um, for you um, when you're listening to English and reading English notice collocations underline them put yeah. them in a book um, work, try and uh, practice them, review them, and, uh, and use them. Um, that is, collocations is one of the areas that tells an examiner the difference between somebody at a band six, band seven level, and a band eight, band nine level. Because um, if you listen to native English speakers, they will use coll collocations just intuitively without even thinking about yeah. it. Whereas um, uh, someone at a, at a band six, band seven level will know the words, they might have a very wide ranging vocabulary, but they might not be able to put those words together, which is make, make, make little um, mistakes with that. I'm not too worried about, about your vocabulary though, um, I just be careful with collocations, but in the test, don't be thinking collocations, collocations, because coll coll that will affect your fluency, because um, there's a balance between fluency and vocabulary and grammar the more you think about vocabulary and grammar normally the lower your fluency but um just be confident that that your i think your vocabulary is good enough to get a band seven at least um the one area that i would be concerned about is small grammatical errors and um, you seem to have a, um two things one would be you seem to be uh, translating sometimes so that's probably because of the way I would guess that you learned English yes. through translation rather than learning it through, yeah, through, yeah. through, through commu communication. Um, the other problem is little fossilized errors. Uh, fossilized errors are errors that you make and you've no idea that you're making them. Okay. So common uh, fossilized errors are things like articles and prepositions. They don't affect, you didn't make article mistakes, by the way, but you made some preposition mistakes. Um, they don't affect communication. So if you're in Dublin and you're in a bar and you're talking to your boyfriend, he won't correct you if you say of instead of in, yeah. you know, if it's a preposition, because he understands exactly what you're saying. Um, but so that means that you never pick up on the mistake that you're making and you make it again and again and again and again and it becomes hardwired natural into your brain. A good way of, uh, of getting around that is to record yourself and listen to. So I think the best advice that I could give you would be get part two questions, look at them, prepare them for one minute, record on your phone and then listen back. Um, because that's going to help your fluency, it's going to help part two, but it will also help you pick up on these little grammatical errors okay. that you're making. You're not making any serious grammatical errors, and you're not making them like every single sentence, because if you were, there's no way that you would have got a band seven and a band eight the last two times that you did it, and I'm not really concerned that you'll get a band six or a band 6.5, but we want to make absolutely 100% mm -hmm. sure. Um, these little errors that you're making with grammar are uh, also present in your writing. So I think working on them is going to help both your speaking and your writing. So we want to make your preparation as efficient as possible. Um, so I think doing that in combination with the reading and the, the listening and the writing that we suggested for you mm -hmm. is going to really help you out. Any questions about the speaking test or any questions about the advice that I gave you? Um. Not now, but I will no, think about it. I think you should be really confident, and, and, and if you um, take those steps, you, I think you'll get at least a band, a, a band seven, um, if not repeat the band eight that, that you got um, last time. So well done. That's good to hear. <laughs>